You're listening to the Underdog Podcast with Scott Kujak, episode 85. Uh, I was coming third and second and in Pan American Games and then went to 90, 95, 96. I went to the uh, World Championship, came second. And then, uh, and then 97 came first and won four World, four world Weightlifting Championships. Yeah. This is the Underdog Podcast, and we bring you interviews from around the world of people including cancer survivors, war veterans, famous athletes, former drug addicts, entrepreneurs, amputees, and many more who became champions in the midst of life-altering adversity, providing you with an example on how to overcome your own challenges. This is your host, Scott Kujek, and I hope this episode ignites a fire inside of you to finish your underdog story. Hey everyone, welcome to this week of the Underdog Podcast. I apologize for the two-week hiatus and the lack of episodes. I got married actually a couple weeks ago and it was a, a wonderful time and then me and my wife, we went traveling and saw some of her friends in Virginia. However, it was a really stressful because the week of our wedding was the week that Texas started to surge in the amount of coronavirus cases. So we were very stressed and worried about do we have to cancel our wedding for a second time? Thankfully, we did not. It was a lot of fun. We had family and friends there, and it was a blast. Another big part of what's been going on this past two weeks is I recently got interviewed by NBC Austin. They did a feature on me and Underdog and the mission behind why I've decided to interview all of these inspirational guests around the world. They also came to my local boxing gym and filmed me hitting the bag and sparring with one of my teammates um, because of my Golden Gloves title here in Austin. And it's a really unique, interesting interview. It actually aired on the evening news on the day that it was published. You can look at this interview, you can watch the video, or you can read the article online. Just type in Scott Kujak, NBC, or KXAN, which is the local affiliation that they use here in Austin. Um, I plan on posting that on my website soon. Of course, you can always go to scottkujak.com and subscribe to receive all the latest underdog news and information. Today's guest is Jerzy Gregorik. He is a refugee from Poland and he tells an amazing story about what it was like to grow up in communism in the 70s and 80s. He had to learn extreme obedience and due to the oppressed area that he was in, he eventually fell into alcoholism as an adolescent. Jersey then tells his entire story of how he turned away from alcoholism and found passion and belonging in weightlifting and how that sport changed his life. He eventually immigrated over here to the United States. He trains top-level celebrities today. He has a crazy stories, and he has a world-renowned book called The Happy Body, which is his methodology on how anyone at any age can have the happy, healthy body and live life to the fullest. He's a special guest, and he's here to dive in 60 minutes with us about his story and the way that he views the world in and outside of sports. So enjoy this episode. Welcome everybody to this episode of the Underdog Podcast. Today I have a special treat for you all. I'm speaking with Jersey Gregorick. He is out in the LA area and he has world records. He's world renowned for some of the things that he has created and adopted and the way that he lives his life. Jersey, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you. Appreciate it. Can you share with all of the listeners where in the LA area that you are logging in from? I'm actually near San Francisco. But oh, you're in San Francisco, I, okay. I, yeah, I'm, a, I'm in LA, uh, Beverly Hills, Santa Monica, that area. So what, uh, every two weeks I'm in LA. So I see my clients there. <laughs> gotcha. Mostly, mostly near San Francisco. Okay, so um, I know you have strong ties to LA. When did you move to San Francisco? Uh, 15 years ago, so uh, my wife was pregnant and um, we have a 15-year-old now girl. So that's really uh, a challenge because uh, it's a, a girl and teenager and locked in, so big challenge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a big challenge. Teenagers, especially teenage girls, can be tough. Hopefully she's not one to have a lot of drama or her friends don't carry a lot of drama, but who knows? <laughs> 
Uh, well, you know, <laughs> yeah. we're dealing with it, right? <laughs> yeah, it's all part of it. So right. Jer Jersey grew up in um, Poland and experienced some things over there. So can you share what that was like growing up as a child and um, as a teenager in the midst of the Cold War? Uh, well, you know, first of all, you know, to be born in communism is really uh, uh, a trauma already because uh, it's like you would be born in a kingdom and the king is really bad <laughs> so and can't do anything to you. So it's in a way, uh, I lived a life of uh, obedience. Yeah, like uh, it's kind of uh, obedience and you, uh, I had to learn that. If not, you could, you know, lose your life easily. So uh, wherever I work, obedience was the way. And, you know, it was like uh, everyone was oppressed and everyone was uh, depressed in a way. Uh, it was really hard to find, uh, you know, goodness and happiness in that system. When I was uh, uh, 15, I really fell into alcoholism and it was really pretty bad until about 18 and a half. And, and I was helped by my friend and he pulled me out of it. I was suicidal, blackouts every day, smoking two or three packs a day. So underdog, <laughs> my underdog began with communism, then moved into, into really alcoholism. So, I w but I was lucky. I was saved, and uh, had really um, the situation that it was uh, it was a coincidence that I was saved. I would say so. I was lucky. So what was lucky. your wake up call for moving out of alcoholism? That is a really tough trend to buck, especially as a young teenager with um, in the midst of communism. How did you do that? I did, didn't have a wake up call. You know, I was suicidal, and then uh, it just coincidence happened that I was in this uh, uh, party and we were all drinking and there was this um, weightlifter who was uh, his uh, weightlifting equipment was thrown out of the house by his mother and then uh, he was telling the story and then I said well you know you can come to my place and yeah you can train there he's an alcoholic alcoholic you know offers everything <laughs> and yeah. nothing, right? <laughs> but it's not really what alcoholic would follow through right so the next day he was there and he and I was already dozing it was about 3 p.m. I was uh, recovering from the morning drinking and then he knocked at my window and I came out and he was there and then he, he said, so what are you doing here? And he said, well, you told me to bring the equipment today. I said, did I? You know, I, I didn't <laughs> remember at all. <laughs> so, well, I said, okay, bring it, everything into my room and then you can train and I will take a nap. And he said, oh, right, let's do a little bit and then, uh, then we can go for a walk. I said, no, 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 I, I, I will take a nap, right? And then after a fair time, he said, well, we can do a little bit and then uh, we'll, we can go for a beer. Oh, uh, when I had beer, right? <laughs> you were in, you were sold. Yeah, like three years I was drinking and I didn't work, so no, no money. It's just only, you know, drinking, that's it. And finding where to drink and who would pay you for, for your drinks. So, so I did a little bit with him, right? And then... Um, and on a daily basis, he was training. He was coming to my place, and then uh, we were going and, and have a beer or something. And then I met my other friends, and it was like that for months. And and somehow, you know, I really like him. So, and uh, I really like more the trainings and um, focusing on on you know the records. I was very weak. I mean, just extremely weak. After three years of drinking, I was gone. I couldn't lift a bar. It was just horrible. The only so, thing you uh, could really lift was probably that beer to your lips, right? <laughs> right yeah. The, the, that, when I was lifting a glass, I couldn't lift because my head was shaking. So it was bouncing uh, against my teeth, you know, like, like this. So I couldn't really drink with, even with a glass. It's really horrible. Sometimes when I drank water, I had to dr drink from the faucet because I... I just couldn't hold the glass. It was horrible. It was just like, okay, well, my uh, life was simply ending really up there. And 
you know, the angel came and saved me. So the months were passing uh, and the air was getting a little bit better in the lifting, drinking still, but it was kind of a little bit less and, and hang, hang out more with athletes and my alcoholics and mixing everything again. And uh, the situation after half a year was that I kind of really liked and I was, I was really better. So I started really shifting and took about probably a year when I really shifted into weightlifting and stopped drinking. It was amazing. Just like uh, uh, sometimes we are lucky and we are saved, right? Yeah, and that set the trajectory for the rest of your life is um, we're going to find out here shortly. You are the weightlifting pro and champion, and you have coached many individuals and have coached yourself to great heights and great success in that endeavor. But before we jump into your full-scale weightlifting career here on the United States side, I wanted to ask you about escaping Poland and fleeing and leaving communism behind. Take us through that journey and how you plan and strategize to actually execute and make that happen without getting in trouble or getting caught? Well, I was uh, 19 years old when I entered the fire department and then uh, I became a fireman. So I went to the fire department instead of to the army. So, uh, so I had to spend three years in the fire department instead of uh, going for, to the army for two years, right? So, um, and the fire department was very interesting because uh, I've never really, I've never really was, you know, in a position to help others. That was kind of first time where, first time that I was going to the fire, it was just really, um, I had this feeling that somebody needs me and it was a really good feeling in me. Uh, it was just overwhelming. I, I felt so good about myself first time. I don't remember when I felt so good about myself that actually I, I am going to save somebody. I'm going to help somebody. It was amazing. It's, it's just like I really laughed because of it, the fire department. I didn't have been a fireman. It was a, that feeling inside that some, you go and, and you will be saving somebody. This is just amazing feeling. And so uh, I fell in love with a fire department and then being a fireman. So after for about five years, so that I also went to high school because I missed completely high school. From 15 to 18, I was drinking and no high school, no study. So when uh, Mira helped me to come out of this alcoholism, I became so greedy for knowledge and then for anything, right? So went to high school, uh, evening school, and in four years, I finished it. So from 20 to 24, I was uh, in a high school and finished the high school. And then I uh, went to, uh, during this time, I was in weightlifting, really heavy lifting. So at 23, my lifting was, I was a first class Olympic weightlifter in Poland. And, and then, uh, you know, it's like an underdog is coming to you. And then you know, <laughs> at 23, I got injured and really uh, badly injured that. I, some, I was losing the connection with my legs and, and uh, paralyzed and, you know, so it was just really tough to, to recover from that through, um, I guess, a lot of luck. So, so my, my L5 moved forward and it's called like a stair and bruised my spinal cord and caused, you know, the uh, temporary Paralyzing. and Was that uh, during a, a weightlifting exercise? Yeah, I was uh, doing the uh, quarter squats and we were about probably 700 pounds and I, my weight was on about 130, 132. That's when my 60 kilo competition was. And, and uh, I lost the, the brace in my core, uh, in my abs, and I wobbled. And when I wobbled, then my L5 moved. And I put the bar back and I was not really uh, affected at that time. But I didn't lift, I went home and next day when I, uh, next day when I woke up, I couldn't feel my legs and my toes. And so that's, that was, that, wow. that was, very, that was very scary. So, uh, so to pause you on that story, because I know you're going to get to eventually escaping Poland, but 
you dealing with this short term paralysis, obviously in the moment you didn't know if it was going to get cured or not. What did you learn about mental toughness and um, mental endurance during that time, especially being so young and coming off a few years of alcoholism? Like how did you learn to grow through the pain rather than returning back to a, a darker period of your life with alcohol? Well, it was a, a very strong uh, weightlifter already. So, um, well, it didn't uh, really prevent me from throwing all the medals and trophies and so on, right? I was very depressed, but uh, I was not crushed, you know? So um, I was, uh, um, I would say, uh, I, I was out of the depression in a way, no matter what would happen to me. So when this happened, it was very devastating, but it was not devastating enough to send me back to where I was when I was alcoholic. When I was alcoholic, it was darkness coming, complete darkness that I, I was not able to um, come out of it on my own. Here, I still, you know, was, uh, uh, I had the experiences of recovering myself for already uh, four years. So I was going to high school, I was going to, uh, and I, I really love education. So education was another part that uh, kept me going. I really wanted to be, to know, <laughs> and I, I didn't want to waste. So it's already like, like I, I lost five years on my life uh, on, on being alcoholic. And, and now I wanted to uh, come out of it, you know, it very fast. I was greedy. I was greedy for education. I was greedy for uh, recovering myself. My friends all, were already, you know, like uh, in medical schools and everywhere, right? And then I was, you know, I, and I was in high school, evening high school, but somehow I was surviving that I, I had always, you know, people around me that helped me. So there was this, uh, uh, edu that you know when I walk on the street there's a lot of alcoholics a lot of gangs around right so to pass uh, about one mile right of the walk to actually get to the school I had to pass really tough places so uh, um, this edu is uh, it was a soccer player and, and he would stop there he kind of knew that I need help and he would walk with me to the to the school, right? And then just talk to me about the focus of where I'm going and always asking me what I'm doing and so on, right? That's and neat. Then, uh, then coming back uh, from uh, from school, he would, so I started school at 5 p.m. and finish about 9 p.m., right? And he was walk, he would walk with me back. It's just, uh, you know, it's just like, uh, there, are, uh, there are people that help you to overcome come out of this underdog right the the, the place and, and they appear in life sometimes sometimes don't right but i was lucky i was lucky he was there so uh after high school i applied to uh recovered from this paralysis uh, paralysis and you know there was a, a situation then i talked to the talked to the surgeon and he said well it is uh, it will you will recover from it and uh, I wouldn't go to Olympic weightlifting because if you do, then uh, you can have a permanent problem. And then, then I recovered and I came back to Olympic weightlifting and uh, I was already in Warsaw uh, studying at the fire protection engineering. So it was the first year, so I was 24. So one year after, and then I was getting this, uh, I was coming back back to uh, to my lifts, so I could snatch a uh, hundred ten kilo, and that was you know my records were one fifteen, and I was very close to uh, to my records. And then I did some squats, and I felt the same pain that I had before, and scared scared me really so much that I. I said, well, you know, that's, that's it. I, I cannot go that direction. If I go that direction, it could be that uh, I will never recover from it. So 
I had to say goodbye to uh, weightlifting. It was really tough at that point, right? So, but I focused on, on the fire department and protect fire protection and engineering. So that I am like in a 78 to 81, four years I'm studying at the fire protection engineering. And 80, solidarity comes to the power in, uh, in uh, uh, Poland. So that was an amazing movement uh, to actually, to catch actually have something like this because you, 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 you were born in a, in a uh, horrible system. That system can override you uh, very fast. You can lose life, you can be tortured, you can be killed and you know, thousands are, right? during this time. So I was, uh, um, when Solidarity came, it was just like, like uh, this, this goodness came from the sky, like never, I've never seen before. Right? It's just, it's not like you have, you're born in a free country like here. Yeah, really, really, I was born a, like a slave, you know, in, in mm. Poland. There's no way to come out of it. And there is no way to, uh, to do anything. Extreme obedience is required. If not, uh, you can vanish. So that's how we live. And when solidarity came, solidarity brought this hope, brought this something with it that maybe, you know, we will be okay. In 81, in 81, when I was just finished my, my fire protection engineering, there was the, I was the head of the students uh, in uh, so there was uh, four hundred firemen uh, in at the fire protection academy, and uh, so the, the government wanted to shift the whole fire department in Poland to use it against demonstrations. And demonstrations eighty one were you know everywhere. It was October the. the October, November, so uh, strikes were everywhere and then marches were everywhere. So it's like a, a nightmare and goodness. So the government tried to uh, pass the law that they could use the fire department if it was civilian force against demonstrations. So uh, in order to do that, they, they had to change the law. We found out that's what they wanted to do and we started strike in, uh, at the uh, academy. So uh, that strike was uh, for 10 days. So for 10 days, I'm smoking, I'm drinking coffee, and not sleeping. 10 days straight, right? So um, after 10 days, uh, I said, well, I will go and have a nap. I lost 22 pounds during this time oh, and, you know, and I'm only like, you know, uh, 60 kilo, right? So uh, 132 pounds, I went to 110, right? Just like bones. So, you know, uh, I went to this uh, place, the, the room upstairs, and then when I was there, I went, I fell asleep and it was about uh, eight or 10, the, I don't know exactly, but about 10 minutes before the attack, fell asleep, deep sleep, and helicopter started landing on the, on the roof. And, and I was just under the roof and they heard this helicopter. That's like, one way to wake up. Right. And I didn't know where I was in the completely confusion. I didn't know what was going on and people were running everywhere. And then they were started attacking the, the academy from the outside. So they rolled uh, the tanks, they rolled the police and in, and they took us out. Um, and they ended the, the strike. They, they took us out and claimed the academy and changed the name. And then uh, they wanted to, you know, have us, you know, uh, uh, under a different name to sign the allegiance to the new school. And hundreds of us didn't sign we went underground and started really, um, uh, you know, doing uh, the work underground. During this time, I met Jerzy Popiuszko. He, he was a, a priest in Warsaw, and he came to help us with prayers and survive this, you know, this hard time. And uh, um, after that, that 
underground happened to me from 81 to 84. <laughs> so I was uh, connected to the, the church at that time and, and, you know, doing everything what uh, was required at the time, helping uh, people to, all the students to go to colleges and study something else. So the fire department was on the blacklist for us. Uh, there was no way to return. So, so how, did, how did you escape all of that? I mean, that, that sounds like a crazy roller coaster ride of, of peace well, yeah, and hope yeah. one moment and then just tragedy the next. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, well, so uh, Jersey was a, a really uh, amazing human being. It was, uh, he was uh, a delight and uh, the hope for whole Poland. Uh, his sermons were, you know, uh, uh, listened by millions in Poland and you know he um he traveled between different uh, cities and, and gave sermons he he, he was uh, uh he was just the the whole light and goodness i've never seen you know a human being with unconditional love and i i thought it was his fate and nobody has it but i when i saw him so wow i was completely shocked by uh this energy inside that there is somebody really that loves people and cares for them and, and that is the person is that way so that was a, um, a revelation for me and i brushed against this you know so i was lucky again you know to to meet somebody like that if there was no strike i would never meet jersey right mm -hmm. but jersey was captured in in 84 he was uh, tortured and uh, martyred and you know uh, it was very, that was a huge loss in, in Poland. It was just for everybody. So uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, 2000, uh, 2018, so he, he was, he said he was recognized by, recognized by the Roman church as a, as a saint. And in 2018, it was this, uh, uh, created a medal for people that were, that fought for the same cause as he was. Fighting. That's remarkable. Yeah, and he's, uh, he was, he's remembered by this uh, three words, truth, love, and forgiveness. And, and it was all about, um, yeah, it was, it was tough. But in 2018, uh, was created this medal. So I, w I received that medal. I went to Poland and went back to the church when I was underground. It's very, very That's emotional really, bit. to go through this back and uh, it was just, it was tough. So it was uh, 84. I also was, um, uh, was uh, asked to come to, uh, to the police station in, in Szczecin. And Szczecin was the, uh, a city near, near where I grew up. And then um, that uh, police station was adjacent to the jail. And then when I was there, right, was the, uh, I was lucky that again, <laughs> it's like an amazing, you know, horrible situation and, and great luck <laughs> so in life. But I guess they go together maybe sometimes for some people, but you know, was lucky again. So, uh, I went up there and it was this uh, huge room where people were sitting, waiting. And then I sat and then I was waiting. And then um, this, uh, this guy came and, and I recognized him. So he was one of the weightlifters that I lifted during uh, my time in, in Poland. And, and he said, what, what are you doing here? I said, well, you know, I told him a little bit my story. And then he said, so I said, what are you are doing here? And he said, I work here. Oh, so, <laughs> so he was, uh, you know, uh, on the other side where I was, right? But we were both weightlifters. So he said, well, wait, and I, I will find out what's going on. So he went and came back. He said, you know, I fix it. You can go home, but you never come back here. You have to, you have to go away. So... He simply uh, probably saved my life up there, right? Uh, um, by 
letting me go. So then, uh, and then I, um, there was this time to get out of the country by the, 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 the whole troublemakers that were not welcoming the country. It was uh, 85. And so I, um, I bought this, you know, ticket to go to, to uh, Malmö on a trip, one day trip. So I was, when I was in, uh, in Malmö, I asked for political asylum there. And my journey started from Sweden and through Germany and came to US in, in 1986. Uh, wow, Th that was incredible detail. And I had zero, zero idea on the background of that entire story. The highs, the lows, losing your friend who fought for a noble cause. I'm so sorry to hear that, um, yeah. you know, but his, his legacy goes on in fame but forever and ever. And you get yeah, to, it's, you know, the, it's, you know, fast forward way. <laughs> yeah. Because a lot of things happen during this time, right? <laughs> and how cool that, you know, something that happened decades and decades ago, he was honored for two years ago. And you got a chance to go back to Poland and receive that medal and, and that honor for him on behalf of him. That's really, really neat. And it's cool. Um, you know, I didn't know if you went straight to the United States, but you hopped to a, a few different countries and eventually landed in california in the la area and that's really where you took off with weightlifting and your personal training so can you share with us when you got here to california and you're beginning your new life your new career um, what were you aiming to do i know that you picked up personal training pretty quickly but what were you aiming to do when you did pick that up and how you're trying to transform the people in southern california well you know i uh, uh so my wife joined me in uh in stockholm i was in stockholm and uh in um during this time uh in stockholm was pretty rough but uh, we were able to go to germany because we couldn't go to us because uh, sweden was uh, uh not a uh, nato uh, country so uh, i wanted to go to us i didn't want to go to canada i could go to canada or australia that uh, I wanted to come to U.S. Somehow U.S. spoke to me. And uh, so I, uh, uh, we, we, we had to go to Germany. From Germany, we came eventually uh, through the CIA, CIA and, you know, all this uh, Munich things. And, you know, we came to, uh, to New York and our sponsors were in Detroit. And in New York, we had this one luggage, like everything, whatever we had, right? Thousand dollars we saved and the one luggage, right? Everything, you know, that way history was in this one luggage. And in Detroit, it was not there, you know, it was gone, right? Oh, so no. Everything, whatever we had was gone, right? Oh, we man. had all the clothes and thousand dollars, it was gone. What a terrible introduction to the United States. Yeah, yeah, it is, but <laughs> gone. Right? So I said, uh, I told Daniela, well, you know, uh, you know, life wants us to be clean, you know, clean slate. <laughs> so, uh, well, for her, it was very, you know, hard, but, you know, for me, it's present moment, is present moment. Yeah, it's just taking off with the present moment. <laughs> So uh, in Detroit, we didn't want to be in Detroit, so um, we bought a ticket and came to LA. And in LA, uh, some people uh, were going to help us, but it happened that they actually didn't. And so we got stuck at the airport, LAX, 11 p.m. and nowhere to go. But we found uh, somebody that, that helped us. Uh, there was this Polish uh, man who was immigrating too. And we went up to his place and slept on on floors for for a while and trying to find a way. And I wanted to to, to coach Olympic weightlifting, so I uh, went to Bob Heiss in Eagle Rock. This is the family, uh, three generations family, and they started American Weightlifting Association. And uh, they talked to Bob, and Bob said, "Well, you know." Uh, all the Olympic weightlifting coaches that they come to our country, they actually uh, open uh, metal shops and, and 
uh, fix car, something like that. They do good business because they know how to do things, <laughs> how to fix things. <laughs> but uh, Olympic weightlifting is not really, uh, nobody wants Olympic weightlifting. So that was like before CrossFit came, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so 10 years after CrossFit came. So I said, okay, well, and I don't want to really fix cars, Bob. So he said, well, you can try something new, something is coming out, like it's called personal trainer. I said, he said, well, some coaches like it, some don't like it because it's not really working with athletes. So I walk, I walk around uh, uh, the, we were in Los Feliz in LA and then we started walking, we walked to Glendale, we went to Burbank. So, you know, we are discovering on, on, on food at, at all places. So, and then we came one day to Power Source, and there was a big weightlifting place, maybe uh, 10, 20,000 square feet, huge. And I, uh, uh, I, got, I asked to, to work there, so you know, they let me to, to work, and then I started really uh, working for, uh, for the gym, $5 per hour. And then uh, we were happy, right? So I uh, started working and people were coming to me sometimes when somebody came first time. So I was writing them programs and figuring out how to help them. And that was, I like that because I, I work with so many injuries in my life and, and, and so many problems that I actually found myself really in a good place. All everything, whatever I was, I uh, was ready for it. So, People really like that, and they started signing, pri uh, signing private lessons with me. And slowly, I was, you know, getting better. And after two and a half years, we bought this small house in Van Nuys, and, and you know, uh, life was uh, really good. People really liked what I did, you know, what I was doing, and Anela became trainer too. And uh, I work sixteen hours a day, every day. Yeah. Then I work like that for, you know, already 32 years, you know, almost every day. <laughs> kind of were loving you, what I do. Were and, you keep were you keeping up with the Olympic weightlifting during this time too, or was it just personal training? So uh, what, what happened is that in uh, 94, I nearly said, so 94, I was 40 years old. And, um, and I nearly said, maybe, maybe we can compete because we're doing mostly bodybuilding, kind of powerlifting, getting stronger, but without really, you know, Olympic weightlifting. So uh, my squad went up really during this time, three, four years, and my, uh, uh, my deadlift was good. So Anila said, maybe, maybe we could compete, right? <laughs> so, so I said, well, I don't know. So we started, really, we had this house and we, transform the the backyard into platforms and olympic weight oh nice old school <laughs> old school <laughs> so you boom and boom right and there's uh, the, the 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 house the neighbors you know sold the house and the the people move in it was all drugs and gangs and you know all this darkness move in and and they first days they have these meetings always dinners and so on and sometimes we you know, drop weights and they, there was this fence and there was like 20 heads, you know, above <laughs> the, and they were just looking at us, what we were doing, right? But they really like us, you know, so, ah, okay, <laughs> you know, we, we never interacted, but they, they had full respect to whatever we were doing and they were just like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So, um, yeah, lifting was going good in 94 95 we went to to canada to uh, the nationals and i went to canada and uh, i was coming third and second and in pan american games and then went to 90 the 95 the 96 i went to the uh, world championship came second and then uh and then 97 came first and won Four world, four world weightlifting championships. Yeah. They went to, to Sydney, went to you know, uh, Melbourne. Uh, 
somehow everything was working <laughs> this time. So that's incredible. And, and not only that, but in 99, you set a, a world record for the master's division that still remains standing today. Can you share with us um, what is your favorite uh, Olympic weightlifting exercise, whether it's squat or deadlift or bench, whatever? And well, then could you share some of your um, personal record, like the biggest numbers that you've done? It's definitely snatch. Snatch was uh, always the, uh, this, it's the fastest move uh, snatch is. So when I was in Poland, I was uh, 115 kilo and then the world was uh, around 125 at that time. So I was getting really close uh, in, in Poland before I got really injured. And then here, uh, when um, I was uh, studying, uh, competing in master divisions, so I came in the snatch to doing uh, one, 105. They're getting really close. <laughs> you know, with, I was 40 something, right? I was doing the 105, so one, 105. And clean and drink about 120, 125, and my best was 150. So uh, it was, uh, uh, I was not far behind really when I was really uh, 23. Now I was 40s, right? And, and, and competing in a whole world going everywhere and and you know it's like weightlifting is a is a really power it that's really power sport it's not powerlifting powerlifting is really strength sport but olympic weightlifting is a power sport so uh, the power generated in olympic weightlifting is the highest power that any athlete can generate so that's why Olympic weightlifting becomes this uh, base for any athletics, right? So no matter what kind of athlete you are, you, you should really be doing uh, Olympic weightlifting. And Olympic weightlifting transfer all the speed and, and, and flexibility, and the coordination needed for a strength to any sport in an easy mm -hmm. way. If you are a tennis player, you know, you need Olympic weightlifting. And then if you are a basketball player, you really need. And then, you know, Kobe Bryant actually was his coach. I had a team at, uh, at Venice uh, Gold Gym from 95 to 2000, five years. And then I moved the team to UCLA weightlifting. So I, I established UCLA weightlifting team, had it from 2000 to 2004 and move 2004 here. <clears throat> I tried to keep you say like weightlifting team, but I couldn't find a coach that was capable actually to be the head coach. And I started uh, going uh, from San Francisco to Los Angeles once a week. And that was not really enough to, to run the, the team. And it was very sad that I lost the team. So um, yeah, so it's, it's a good, Oh yeah, we did a lot. We lost the house. We foreclosed the house in in '96. The house lost the 50 percent value. The Northridge earthquake hit, and when our house lost 50 percent, and whatever we had in this house, we foreclosed after seven years to fight to keep the house. So underdog again. So <laughs> we moved to um, to Marina del Rey and. Uh, move into an apartment and we moved, uh, moved to Santa Monica to an apartment. That was really tough. Uh, and also we started studying 96 uh, in Vermont for um, MFA in creative writing, so, which I finished in, uh, in, in 98. So a lot of things we were doing <laughs> during this time. We were competing, we were studying and, and we were writing poetry and, and we were coaching teams and we were coaching people <laughs> a lot of different things you had going on in that those 10 12 years and olympic weightlifting definitely opened up a ton of doors for you in terms of business meeting different clients networking and then providing a stable income um but also just shattering world records whenever you could get a chance <laughs> So I, I want to ask you about this. So one of the things that I would probably argue that you're most proud of and that you really are a huge proponent of today is your happy body routine. And that is um, basically your method, your tried and true methods of living a healthy and abundant life in multiple different areas. So can you share in, in what ways does it share similar principles as Olympic weightlifting? And in what ways does it differ from Olympic weightlifting? 
So first of all, you know, when I was a trainer, you know, uh, in uh, tennis goals uh, in uh, North Hollywood, and uh, I also was going to houses and all around. I was just everywhere. <laughs> so then I, um, whatever I was doing, I was doing people really like, and and uh, I just thought about to put something into a, a program that what I was doing and how I was doing that. Um, so, so people could have the program, but also could have transparency. I, I wanted just not to be uh, really only the training because the whole fitness was so vague and it is vague today. So it's really, it really was really hard to find transparency in, in how to train and where, where are we going? What are the standards? What are the goals? So what do we want? And people wanted a lot of different things. Some people wanted, you know, the, uh, be attractive. Some people wanted to uh, heal, you know, injuries. Some wanted to get rid of medications and some people wanted to, uh, you know, to feel good and be happy and, and lose weight and gain weight, gain muscle, you know, and, and be powerful. So, but, you know, everything uh, like this uh, can happen with really following certain standards like speed, strength, flexibility, uh, certain ideal body weight and then uh, leanness. All of it kind of like go into one direction with certain standards around. So uh, we established six standards. So uh, we thought ideal body weight is important then leanness is important, how much mass we have and how much fat. To be strong is important, to be powerful is important, to, uh, to have a good posture is important so you don't age in a, and become really uh, a person, you know, looking very old and, and have problems. And then um, we, we, we knew what to do with flexibility. We knew what to do with ideal body weight, which, uh, you know, came from all the athletes and, 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 and all our experiences, but we didn't know really what to do with strength and how to, how to stop in the strength, what, how, to, how, much is, how much the strength we really need. So um, I was in 2002 in, in Melbourne and competing that, the world championship. And then uh, at the beginning, the oldest lifters usually lift the first day and then goes to the youngest, right? And so there were people who were 80s and 90s, you know, competing. And, and I sat and I watched. And this Charlie Henderson came and he was 80 years old from uh, Australia. And he was 60 kilo and the body weight. That was my body weight in Poland, right? And he was 60 kilo and I competed in the same uh, uh, weight there. And he came... And on the bar was more than 60 kilos. So he was going to attempt, you know, to live more than his body weight at eight year old, right? Oh. So, so I was Jeez. just looking at that and it says, wow. And I was just looking at that. And then he came and bam, 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 and was just up and then and dropped away. And that transport that transferred me to Poland when I was 14 years old, 15 years old. You know, all the boys were lifting weights sometimes somewhere. Uh, they brought the, the weights and twice a uh, year, yeah, they were just competing who is the strongest. <laughs> and, and, you know, the best of us could really lift the body weight. And he is the guy who is lifting. He's 80 years old and, and doing the same thing. So it, it strikes me that actually should, that should be the standard of strength when we go through the whole life, right? So when we are starting, let's say, in, in 18 and 20 and you go through life, at least you should be strong like that. And if you, if you want to get the strength when you are 20 or 30 or 40s, it should be easy for you to get, right? So, uh, so I thought... I will need that standard somehow to transcend to the, the happy body. The happy body was 18 exercises. And then the exercise that is in the first sequence is, is uh, it's a squat and press. So you have to squat with the bar or dumbbells and press and stand up. So that's kind of a, a 
the gateway to the Olympic weightlifting. If you can do that, then you can do Olympic weightlifting. You can start, you can clean and jerk, you can do anything because your flexibility and coordination is ready. But the strength in that has to be there too in order to lift. So, so there, there is calculations where that you have to uh, press behind the neck 58% of the weight that you want to do clean and jerk. All right, so these are the connections. So then I thought, okay, so I should get the 58% calculate everyone into this, uh, this squat and press and get the 58%. It means to, you know, uh, 20 and 9% in each hand, right? With its dumbbells and be able to do that and train toward that. Got it, right? So then I established the standard of strength and I thought, if you do it in five seconds, that is great. So this, the standard of speed was established by the standard of strength and the whole, and the whole program was, is geared toward this robust body system, yeah, the happy body. It's, a, it's not only that you are flexible, it's not only that you cannot age the posture, but also you are strong, you are fast, and you are coordinated. And then also your, your, your body mass is not going to drop if you, if you age, right? Because aging is the situation where people, uh, you know, lose their muscle, is the strength and so on. So I thought, okay, we should go for life that way, that you pick up the happy body, let's say that you are 20s and 30s, you uh, achieve the standard of strength, and you keep it until you're 80 and 90, yeah? And then after that, maybe you lose. But if you have this capability, then you can never age in a way because you are capable to do anything in, in life. You can, you can go and ski, you can do, go and surf, you can go and uh, skateboard, whatever you want. But, that's incredible power right, to have to face a normal life. So the, the, the standard was found in 2002 and I was able to close everything and create the transparency and the whole um, you know, system that people scientifically embrace so people could actually coach themselves uh, and go through it without me, without anybody. So it's like bikini, the happy body is like swimming or weightlifting, right? So that's the happy body. The happy body is this thing, right? So uh, of course there is the happy body. For me, the happy body is there too, because if I didn't have the happy body, I would be probably, I don't know, I wouldn't know what I'm supposed to be. So the happy body gives me the number and I uh, oscillate myself around this number, you know, like I am about 140 pounds and when I become 145, I know what to do to become 140. So there's all whole plan the heavy body controls the, the, uh, the body weight. And then of course there is a plan to get stronger, you know, faster and flexible, all of it in, in the one thing. All of it is transparency in numbers, in science, amazing right? Amazing thing. And people get it and sometimes send me emails after two, three years, how that, you know, really help them to achieve this, you know, this robust body system in their own life, right? By themselves somewhere. Incredible. That's what I wanted. I wanted 20 years ago, I wanted to create such a thing that people uh, could do it for themselves, right? Because you know, why not? It's not like uh, something uh, complex. So I wanted to give the fitness, fitness right, transparency. And, uh, very, very, very unique. I feel like most um, Olympic powerlifters that I see, I don't necessarily know anybody, but they just kind of, or like big guys at the gym, they just, they look like meatheads and all they care about is who can bench the most or who can lift the most in a certain exercise. They're not concerned about muscle stamina or flexibility or endurance or just overall well-being and mental health and it's cool how you've combined all of that into one book and one practice and that it's not just hey this is what i think is best but this is the science behind why i know this is best and this is going to transform your life not just from a physical perspective but in multiple multiple ways very very intriguing very interesting i encourage everyone to go check out the happy body 
it's a book. I know there's programs on different information online, but it is um, a really, really unique outlook on physical and mental well-being. Um, one of the last things I want to ask you, Jersey, before we move into the last three questions um, that I ask every single guest is um, you've coined the term hard choices, easy life, easy choices, hard life. Very, very um, simple statement um, in that juxtaposition, but very profound. How did you either think of that or did you take that from somebody else? And um, how do you try to live that out every single day? That was, uh, you know, when I, 2009, when the, the Happy Body book was published, you know, I thought, okay, people have it now and they can, uh, they can uh, achieve that uh, amazing body for themselves, amazing life, like a, the Happy Body, like a skill of living. But it was all physical. And still I was getting clients in my place and, and they noticed that it's really hard for them to actually achieve it. So um, they would uh, have this fatalist inside sometimes that would take them on the um, uh, to you know on the destructive path, right? So uh, they would do something good and then they would do something bad. They would you know fall into the easy choices. So, so, so slowly, I start really recognizing that people have voices inside the brain, in the, the mind. They have this voice of to do the easy way and, and to never really get better. And they have this voice, the dream voice of uh, hard choices and to do accept what is really hard to do, but that is necessary to get better in life. So, and that is a mixture of this. So I wrote really three books about mastering those uh, choices to eventually come out as a as a master and not as a fatalist in life. So uh, after about four years, I, I, uh, I dealt with, uh, with this dialogues and, and, and the mind, how the mind is really uh, uh, working around to be the master or to be fatalist and who is going to win. Now, um, when I was uh, doing this, Naval was, uh, Ravikan was uh, my client, uh, and then uh, one day I went to Diwali to his place and, and it was this Indian um, holiday and but maybe it was four years ago or five and he we were talking about how you describe something that is in uh, it's really hard to describe but in a few words and it's very uh, meaningful potent right and then he said you know I learned something from people, he said, I learned from Aristotle uh, one thing. He said, two words, know yourself. And you know, it's a, such a, uh, like two words, right? Know yourself, wow. But you know, when I came out of alcoholism, that's what I wanted. I wanted to know myself, to know the planet, to know everything, right? I was so greedy and I'm greedy today. There's like <laughs> no change in, in my life. And no intensity drop, you know, from, you know, uh, this, this 19 year old that woke up in life until today, I am 66. It's just all the time, you know, this intensity of learning, intensity of becoming better in life and focusing just on that. So uh, know yourself, right? Then the boss said, you know, Buddha said that, you know, desire is suffering, three words, right? So here it is, you know, uh, the words really that really tell us that we can really suffer because we have desires, but when we have desires, how to go around this, those desires, right? So I came out with a zero expectation idea, right? So uh, it means that when I'm in present moment, I do everything, but I'm okay with everything what happens out of it. So uh, if it's not good, I'm okay. If it's bad, so I adapted Stoic's idea of controlling outside, not controlling outside, you know, focus on inside and staying with that, staying healthy, staying in the present moment without the past, without the future, but in the present and do 
in the present everything what you can and so focus on the hard choices here and not on the easy ones right so Naval said and I, I from Jersey I, I learned hard choices easy life easy choices hard life and that you know tells us how to live life it's really uh, aligned also with stoicism and stoic principle of living the life that uh, it's a constant, uh, it's, it's a responsibility to the planet to become the best of you and to serve it. So it's, a, it is, uh, it's, it's an interesting outcome of, uh, of, the, of the working on yourself forever until you die. And really that concept striking me that, uh, that I'm, constantly focus on that and the hard choices in life is this uh, is this a uh, way of uh, telling people well listen the life happens right and uh, there is this saying uh, to uh, kind of understand it the saying is you go forward you get better and you die you go backward you get worse you die so why not to go forward? <laughs> well, that's what, you know, the hard choices is like kind of uh, saying the same thing. Why not to pick up the hard choices? But the hard choices is always the hard choices when you want to do something that is better than ever for you. So the hard choices are always education. When you don't understand something, when you are physically not capable, the hard choices actually is to be able to you know, to do certain things that you can actually do that. So it's a constant uh, improvement of yourself and dealing with the, uh, with the obstacles on the way to overcome the obstacles because you want to get better. So in a way, we, were, we are on hard choices in education from, you know, uh, when we are born to, to, uh, to through the whole life. And, you know, at a certain point, that two plus two was really hard for us to know that it's four. So the teachers and parents will work on us until we really get there. It's always a hard choice, right? By parents and by teachers. But it's kind of included completely in the, in the education process. It has to happen. But it's really hard. If they didn't pick up that hard choice, right? We would never know that two plus two is four. So two plus two, and then becomes the, of course, calculus and, and, and education move on. Uh, moves on until, you know, that there's a time that we stop. And why to stop? I don't get it why people stop, right? And so uh, why not keep going, keep educating yourself in every dire direction? Why not to work on the body that way? Why not to live that way that you constantly find the hard choice because you want to make things better and then because of that you you build something you 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 build something that you always ready for that being underdog right so when you become underdog you don't have a really a big problem with that that you're underdog i was underdog so many times but you know the the more i work on the hard choices the, the underdog really doesn't mean anything. I, I crash, that's okay. And then the crash builds me uh, even better because I crashed. So, you know, it's like, <laughs> it's actually, I use it uh, to, toward, you know, um, getting up and, and become better because of it. Because I use the hard choice. I don't go into the easy choice of complaining and blaming people and 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 being depressed or whatever right i'm not interested in that i'm interested coming out of it what needs to be done in order to come out of the being underdog or you know fix something that i crushed and i because of that i really don't know what the complaint is i don't know what the blame is i don't know what you know the uh, depression is i don't know what the anxiety is i don't know what the fear of death is is it completely illogical? So why to be that way? So, you know, all of it is gone. I mean, gone. 
say so when you when you focus on the hard choices easy life and you live that way of life you are on a constant improvement until you die continuous improvement definitely a life model and, and if anybody is listen or is watching the video right now you can see that jersey at 66 looks better and has more youthful energy than probably the 21 year olds that you know in your life he is full of energy and he has that happy life because he has um made some very hard choices but it's led to an easier life when he's 66 and he can still do things that he used to do in his youth uh jersey th thank you for that wonderful wonderful story and summary of your life and a lot of key insights that we get to take away from that interview i want to ask you the last three questions i ask every single guest and just see how your answers compare to some of the other um, amazing guests that we've had on the show number one is we you, you might have already shared this with us before but number one is what is your favorite quote well that's the hard choices <laughs> <laughs> that's what i figured but i wanted to ask <laughs> just in case right? that's, uh, uh, that's the quote you know that you know if you really comprehend that quote and uh embrace that quote and make the part of your life it will drive you like crazy forever and and forever to get better and better and that's the only focus you can have the easy choice sometimes it can happen but you will uh you, you will turn around and get into the hard choice of course you know in life you have to read a lot of uh stories and lectures and meet really great mentors that can help you with this uh, acceptance of the hard choices poetry is really good here any philosophy that can help you to really accept the hard choice that would be you know that would be really this is just the, the greatest thing that can happen to you number two how has being an underdog in your story shaped you into the person today the person that you are today excuse me well i think that you know that uh eliminated that uh thinking sorry for myself right it, the underdog doesn't mean anything it just means that uh it's a normal thing that happens in life you you crash and then you you use it to come out of it and become better than before and and that's, uh, um, you know, like we lost our house in 96 and then uh, we started recovering ourselves. It took us, you know, seven years. It was really tough seven years, but we focus on building. We focus on recovery. We focus on becoming better and not really focus that the life is not fair or that, or that you know, we are too old or whatever, right? <laughs> so, not such a thing so um eliminate eliminate feeling sorry for yourself i like that i haven't um heard that um an answer to that question in in that way before i like i like that a lot and next time something bad happens to me i'm, I'm gonna think of that just eliminating feeling bad for myself and finding a way uh, to move uh, on don't go there right <laughs> recover from the crash and uh number three is how do you define success and why do you consider yourself successful i think that you know uh really life is about to be happy and and happiness uh, whatever you know um, man, people say there's so <laughs> that is like too much we talk too much we think about that but happiness is really uh the the final outcome of of our life and if we live that life um the right way with virtues with becoming better with hard choices we have a chance that the happiness is the side effect of that life so uh, the 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 happiness is not really about you know wealth and it's not about health and about whatever it is it's available for all of us right because that has to be that way it, it, so it cannot depend on something outside it has to be something that you know what we are and um and you probably know that we have a lot of wealthy people that are not happy and we have a lot of poor people that are not happy everybody can be not happy right so there is a way really that this happiness happens to us and i believe that when you 
live this virtuous life and and then if you um, work on yourself uh, to uh, be a person the good person living a good life it means like you you don't take advantage of another human being you live the life through your own virtues you you don't complain, you don't blame, you don't do those things, you don't get angry, you, know, you work on yourself not to be, it doesn't mean that you are perfect, right? But you, you we choose the hard choices uh, to uh, get better. So if you get angry, you work on yourself not to be angry. You, you, you catch yourself and then you, you strategize, you know, to help yourself you know, to, to overcome that problem. And if you complain, you work on yourself. If you have anxiety, you work on yourself. It's just like you constantly work on removing this negativity out of your life and focus on more present moment and choose the, the hard choice. And because of that, the virtues will happen in, in your life. You start feeling good about yourself, who you are. And then because of that, you know, we, you will get that feeling in inside what we maybe call happiness. Great response. Jersey, you are a wealth of knowledge and experience and insight that we can all take different lessons of life and move forward with and, and remind ourselves of how to respond to certain situations or how to treat our body or how to treat others. Thank you so much for coming on Underdog. How can we as an audience connect with you or learn more about you? Do you have public social media profiles or should we just go to your website? We have the website, we are working on the website, but uh, our uh, Facebook is really active, the Happy Body Facebook we have, and Jersey Gregoric, of course, uh, Facebook. The book on Amazon is this, right? So it's a new version, really cool. And I think that that's the best way to start I've written like uh, uh, about seven, eight books to work on this inner strength that we need to build to overcome our, you know, uh, impulses uh, when it comes to um, to the weaknesses to overcome something what is really hard for us to overcome. So the building the inner strength is important. That's where I wrote other books like this one, for example. Uh, this is the the virtues daily practices for the modern stoic, for example. So it's a lot of, uh, um, um, I focus, I guess I focus my whole life to help helping people to, first I created the happy body and then I focus how a person can actually, uh, you know, achieve that, how a person can be successful with that. And then, you know, the whole philosophy was created around that, how to actually build that inner strength that uh, can carry over a person from being depressed, from being, being weak, from being you know, in pain, and carry over to that, uh, to that happy body, to that system that the person could you know, embrace, practice, find the hard choices, and evolve within the process and journey, and after a year or two and five, create this, you know, uh, this uh, beautiful uh, way of living thank you jersey definitely a lot of material that you have contributed to or written yourself that we can check out um, everybody thank you for tuning into this episode jersey you are a wonderful guest um, I, I learned a lot from your episode thank Perfect. you so much for joining from california and um, we look forward to the next episode which will be coming up again next week and um, again, any information you want to know about Jersey or Underdog Podcast in general, just click the show notes below you. Jersey, thanks for coming on. Thanks, guys. Pleasure. Thank you for coming on the show, Jersey. And thank you to all of you who stuck around until the end to hear this last little bit. If you could leave a rating and review in your podcast app, it would be a huge help to me and the team here at Underdog. It helps promote the show and boost the show to people who haven't heard of it before. And if you would like to stay up to date on all of the latest information about me and my other Underdog guests, please visit scottkujak.com or you can follow us on social media at underdog underscore podcast on both Facebook and Instagram. 
Again, just a friendly reminder that I shared with you guys at the beginning of the episode, you can see the featured NBC story on me if you just type in Scott Kujak NBC on Google. I'll have it uploaded to my website soon. And if you have any recommendations for podcast guests or things that I'm doing, things that you would like to see out of the show, please reach out to me through any social media platform and I would be happy to respond to your requests. Coming up next week features a woman who suffered from diabetes at the at 17 years old onward and she had delayed onset diabetes and it completely changed her life and how she viewed life and the things that she was once able to do she no longer could any longer so what did she decide to do well in her 40s she decided to bike across the united states of america she biked over 3500 miles from san francisco to New York City. You won't want to miss this story. She's an amazing, energetic, enthusiastic woman, and she will bring the absolute utmost energy level when you hear from her next week. Her story is incredible. It's amazing. Don't miss out. Tune in next Tuesday. Until then, finish your underdog story and find the will to never give up.